Welcome, everybody. Here we are at the Global Wellness Conversations podcast recording at the second annual Global Wellness Summit Wellness Real Estate Symposium in New York City. And I'm sitting with quite the famous public health figure, Joseph G. Allen, Professor Allen. He's an assistant professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He created the Healthy Buildings Program at Harvard, which uh, who knew they had one? And he authored recently the book, Healthy Buildings, How Indoor Spaces Can Make You Sick or Keep You Well. Joe, welcome. Nice to be with you. Listen, I think this is so exciting because you investigate sick buildings. Is that right? I have and do. And unfortunately, um, that's the reality. I think a lot of the ways we've designed our buildings historically, uh, we've created buildings that uh, people can get sick in. And I mean everything from uh, not feeling well, not being able to concentrate, having a headache, all the way through buildings where um, you know we see cancer clusters. What? And it's the reality of the of the spaces. I think um, health hasn't been at the forefront of how we have always designed and operated our buildings. And so for years, I did forensic investigations of sick buildings. And so like yeah. the murder shows, the um, whodunits on TV, the forensic scientists study murders, you study what's wrong with this building. Is yeah, from the, from the science perspective, right? So, so what is it that would potentially contribute? Is it uh, the chemicals in the space? Is it how the air handling system is working? Is it the amount of clean air? Is it something happening in the water? Um, and honestly, I got tired of doing this. For obvious reasons, right? The the mostly because we know how to do it right, and we just hadn't been doing it. So when I got to Harvard, the goal was to how do you flip this conversation and stop chasing sick buildings and design them healthy from the start? It's not it's not a mystery. We know how to do it. Wow. Um, but the reality is, yeah, sick buildings are a thing. The New York Times said that your book is a call to action for every developer, building owner, shareholder, CEO, manager, teacher, parent to start demanding healthy buildings with cleaner indoor air. Can you tell us three reasons to the uninitiated? It sounds like, sure, who wouldn't want clean air, but what specifically do you mean by that? Uh, what factors we're actually looking for? Mm -hmm. I think it's a handful of things. First, um, uh, let's start with the absolute basics, right? Uh, air quality. So of course we wanna breathe in healthy air and we know how to do that, but unfortunately we've kind of closed off our buildings so much that we've stopped letting them breathe. And we've just choked off the air supply in our building. So I think that's uh, an absolute, uh, one of the key features or foundations. I think some of the basics too around water quality, right? I think we've done an okay job there, but there's more we can do to make sure the water we're drinking and the water that pump, plums through buildings uh, is actually healthy. And then I think there's a whole other set, and I kind of put it under nature-inspired design, things like uh, lighting and acoustics, biophilic design. Like how do you reconnect with nature in our buildings? So you asked for three, I think I'd put those, maybe it's hard to pick uh, which are the most important. I think they're all important and it depends on the building type, but some of the absolute basics, air, light, water, sound, right? These are the things that we know are really important to uh, uh, making sure we have a healthy indoor environment and we know that it uh, leads to healthier living. Well, it is funny when you just, once again, for the uninitiated, uninitiated because this podcast is listened to around the world, um, you might think, well, how cute having biophilic design, but do we really need it? I mean, tell me um, your top reasons why you think it's so important to pay attention. I mean, I think Delos says we spend, is it 90% of our time indoors as a species? Is that right? Yeah, that comes from a, a statistic published a long time ago, um, and we talk about this all the time. We're an indoor species. We talk about it in our book. In my book, we talk about calculating your indoor age. We spend, if you live to your 80, 72 years of your life indoors. Um, and the idea of biophilic design, I'm an evidence-based uh, scientist, right? And it can sound hand wavy in the sense that, yeah, if we connect with nature, we'll feel better, Ooh, yes. <laughs> and also, um, but if you look at the, the, the science that's out there, including some of the work by uh, my team, showing that we're, when we're in these spaces that have nature or biomorphic shapes and patterns, doesn't have to be a plant, uh, we see um, people perform better on cognitive function tests, specifically around creativity. Also, we find a better and more quick uh, reduction in stress. So if you stress people and we'd randomize, put them in a room not designed to these features, and then some get randomized, put into a room, that is nature-inspired design. And we see a quicker stress recovery in the people who are in these rooms. 
And now, so we've quantified this, right? In, in rigorous peer-reviewed studies, I also think it's kind of funny or maybe not necessary that we need, you know, studies from a, a team at Harvard telling us that, um, you know, we feel better when we're connected with nature, right? You don't feel well, you go for a walk outside, <laughs> right? it starts to clear your head, go into a park, go to a national park. We all feel that uh, power to kind of de-stress and also kind of reset. And I think we can use the indoor spaces to do the same thing, not to the extent as a national park, but that we need to bring more of that uh, into our spaces where we're spending all this time. And also, you said it's just basic money out the door. When you don't take care of the indoor environment, the biz- the business is going to lose money for their workers, and the people are going to get sicker. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's a really simple um, uh, simple math on, on uh, the business benefits. And, I, and I've written a lot about this. My co-author of the book, Healthy Buildings, is John McCumber. He's a professor at Harvard Business School, an expert in real estate finance. We I think, make a compelling case in the book that outside of my personal goal of just improving health, it's just good business. And I think there's multiple levels. You could take it on an individual level. Studies we've done showing better air quality associated with better cognitive function. So you're here, you're going to perform better, you feel better, you're going to work better. Great. In the book, we show the business benefits. If you roll this all up, we estimate gains of 10% to the bottom line of the business. There are studies then showing if you're an investor or developer, that you invest in these healthy buildings, they have uh, command greater rents per square foot. There are studies looking at the macroeconomics here, showing in the U.S. alone, there's over $20 billion can be added to the uh, the economy just by improving indoor air quality and per- uh, improving performance and productivity. So anyway, you look at it, individual, business, investor, developer, societal, healthy buildings are just They just make sense from a pure economic standpoint, and we get all those health benefits. So during COVID, you really came to the fore because we were all smacked in the face with, ouch, where we are inside, we could make each other sick. I read um, or heard some presentation you gave that they found that COVID really wasn't caught outside, only inside. Yeah, I, you know, the reality is uh, we had very little, if any, spread outside. Why is that? Unlimited dilution and ventilation, right? Wow. Indoors, we're all emitting respiratory aerosols. Right now we're doing this, they're accumulating indoors. They will build up inside unless it's well ventilated or using filters to capture these particles from our lungs. And so what we saw through COVID and saw this right away is that nearly all the spread was indoors wow. in places with poor ventilation and poor filtration. You look at any outbreak through the pandemic, whether it's at a uh, school, an office, on a bus, in a gym, or a choir practice, all have the same underlying factors. Time indoors, low ventilation to no ventilation, and low filtration. It was just so obvious, and we've known this for a long time. It's not like we learned this when COVID hit. The first piece I wrote was in February 9th, 2020. This virus is spread through the air. Healthy buildings need to be the first line of defense. We knew this on day one of the pandemic. Yeah, I think um, you also mentioned, yeah, we were good at some things like the vaccine, et cetera, but the buildings we were a little late at, at realizing. Is that right? Yeah, I think we did. The country did a really good job in the US, and I think around the world, of producing a vaccine in record time. And it's a life saving vaccine. Um, but we needed to be sure that we had that bridge to the vaccine and therapeutics, and the bridge, what we call non pharmaceutical interventions or NPIs, one of which, Uh, had to be how we design and operate our buildings. It was ignored. If you look at the World Health Organization, CDC, and others, this was an area they weren't telling people about. They were telling people, uh, stay back six feet, it's good advice, Uh, wash your hands, don't take your mail, things that didn't make a lot of sense. Um, And they weren't telling people, this spreads through the air, open up your windows. And uh, that simple strategy would have really helped a lot of people. Can you imagine? Uh, My husband works in a hospital, and he was on the ground floor with the barriers between dust and the air open. He got the worst case of COVID early on. It was so terrifying. And when I dug through the building's code, it was very sad. So anyway, he got better, so that's good. good. But you said there are telltale signs of a sick building. Can you tell us what some of those are? Yeah, so the first one is listen to the people in the building. They'll tell you. They'll tell you right away. Is the first thing I ever did in the uh, in forensic investigations. People who live or work in these spaces know what's going on. They'll tell you something's not right over there. I don't feel right in this room. There's a an odor. 
Uh, it's at a particular time of day, it goes away, it's related to something happening outside or construction, right? The, the best scientific instrument is us. And, um, and, and so that's the first thing you have to do. And our, the goal of at least healthy building strategies is to make sure it doesn't get to that point. You proactively design your space to be healthy such that you don't have to rely on people experiencing the ill effects of a poorly performing building then tell you, hey, something's not right in this space. Uh, we can actually do better up front. But that'd be the first thing. Uh, I think that's the telltale side is listening to your people. Wow. Um, the other thing is that, you know, we're sitting right now at J.P. Morgan Chase at 46th and Lex. But J.P. Morgan is going to speak today at the symposium about how much they believe in this concept. In fact, they hired you to help them with their new uh, 270 Park Avenue building, right? And Deepak Chopra will speak today, too. He's going to talk about the lifestyle enhancements, meditation, prayer, yoga, cycling, physical therapy, mother's room, a food hall by Danny Meyer. Okay, that's sexy stuff. What's some of the nuts and bolts that you are guiding them on doing? Well, it's an incredible building, and I give them a lot of credit for leadership in this space for uh, seeing this years ago in the conception phase of this building to say, uh, we see the healthy buildings movement coming. How do we lead it? How do we make sure... Uh, this is the, the healthiest building. Um, and it's some things that will be out of sight. You know, uh, good air quality is invisible. And, and um, uh, But this building is actually uh, exceeding even the most, uh, you know, the, the healthiest uh, ventilation standards that exist. They saw the science and they're acting on it, you know, years, if not decades ahead of code and other developers. Um, this, I found this organization to be really thoughtful in terms of, you um, listening to the, the best science that's out there, and then putting that into action. Into action. Yeah. That I read where it's all electric, double ventilation, indoor air monitoring, but I think the most surprising thing to me is that that building will give off no greenhouse gas emissions at all. Is that right? Well, yeah, it's one of the, it's the first all-electric tower, certainly of this size uh, in, the, in, in uh, New York City. Um, and it's drawing on a renewable energy source. So therefore, your operational energy is not, you're not burning fossil fuels to run your building. And we have to, uh, of course, this is a, a priority thing about climate change and also buildings as, as uh, uh, they consume 40% of global energy. They're a major contributor. That's crazy. Yeah. 40% yeah. of global energy is consumed by buildings. I don't think people know that. <laughs> In a place like New York City, it's almost 80%. Wow. So we have a, um, we have a responsibility to make sure our buildings, we reduce the carbon intensity or carbon footprint of our buildings, a lot of that comes from the operational uh, energy. So where's your energy source? Is your energy coming from coal-fired power plants, coming from natural gas, or is it coming from renewables? So all electric tower means no on-site fossil fuel combustion, and the energy it's taking from power plants comes from renewable uh, source. So uh, it's really quite incredible. And at the same time, at the same time, they're not sacrificing on indoor air quality. They're not cutting down energy to cut off the air supply to save save energy. They're actually improving air quality, bringing in more outdoor air, better filters, monitoring things in real time to be sure that it's working and verify it's working, and being responsible in terms of their carbon emissions and carbon footprint. It really is a model for how we have to think about buildings going forward. For a long time, it's been presented as a, as a trade-off. I'm going to have a green building. I might sacrifice some health aspects. I'm going to have a healthy building, sacrifice green. It's kind of how the market is, has thought about it, but really they're showing how you have to merge both of these, uh, and it totally can be done. Okay, so we have on the wall here the nine foundations of a healthy building. Can you tell me what those are? We're looking at them, but... Sure. So this was a, uh, a, a report produced by my Harvard uh, Healthy Buildings Program. <clears throat> Maybe it's uh, eight years, nine years old at this point, but we we saw this gap in the, in the uh, market uh, um, around, you know, what is a healthy building? It actually came from, a, I was at a conference with, with some real estate leaders, and I said, we're overcomplicating this. There's just a handful of things we have to do. And Thank of, God. people leaned in and said, well, what are they? And I said, okay, we just need to produce this report. So we talk about the things we talked about earlier, lighting, acoustics, um, feeling safe and secure in a space, water quality, ventilation, all of these fundamental aspects that you know, are not just a collection of words or phrases, it's tied back to the peer-reviewed science. So for all of these, you can make the connection, you know, how does air quality influence health? We can talk about all the different ways that influences cognitive function, immune health, respiratory health, uh, how these things influence our reproductive health. So it's all real, you know, hard science that underpins this. It's the framework we use 
uh, at my Harvard Healthy Buildings program to talk about all of the, the science. What's the thermal health? Because we see, okay, ventilation, for those who can't see this, ventilation, lighting and views, noise, water quality, safety and security, cleaning and pest management, New York rat czar, moisture, thermal health. So tell me about thermal health and moisture. Yeah, so thermal health, I mean, um, most people talk about in terms of thermal comfort. Um, and that's basically things like um, temperature and humidity and how it influences, uh, one, feeling comfortable in a space, but actually how it influences performance and actually influences your health. And one of the things we've tried to do here is rebrand this idea of thermal comfort, which is what everyone talks about, and say, this is actually thermal health. Wow. Meaning it actually influences your health. Because very often when I've done these, uh, when I've worked uh, with organizations and, and think about um, uh, people and their performance in a space, it's very easy for someone to say, well, you're, you're uncomfortable, you're just complaining, it's a comfort issue. You know, it's too hot, it's too cold, that, that's, you're, you're a complainer. You're a whiner, yeah. You're a complainer. But by switching the language here to say, well, it's not thermal comfort, it's thermal health. This is actually, you should pay attention to that person. They're telling you something, one, about their, how they feel, how they're performing in the space, and two, they're telling you how the building is performing. So, um, you know, the, the, the thermal conditions in a space are directly related to our health. It's not just... Am I uncomfortable or comfortable in this space? It's pretty exciting. Um, well, it is exciting to think of new new builds that have all these amazing features. But what about, we, we walked on the High Line last night. I mean, there were so many gorgeous buildings. What a place, what a joy. But I looked at that after I read your material. Are these buildings sick and they look pretty? <laughs> Can you fix them? For sure. I think, I think there's um, a common misperception that only the, you know, shiny new buildings can be healthy and all these kind of old buildings are unhealthy. When the reality is I've seen it both ways. I've seen shiny new buildings not be designed so great. They look gorgeous. Wow. But maybe they hadn't been paying attention to things like indoor air quality. And I've seen old buildings that, yeah, can have some problems, but I've also seen them brought up with just a little bit of investment. You can have these old buildings that perform great in terms of all of these nine foundations of a healthy building. So it's not, it's not so easy. People have said, oh, well, I could just tell you, you know, what's the age of the building? That's going to tell me if it's healthy or not. I totally disagree. And I also think we've, we've um, it's a mistake when people say, well, it's only new buildings that can be healthy. Uh, yeah, it's easier to design a new building to be healthy right up front, but it shouldn't be a barrier to someone who's in an older building to say, well, if I make a couple of these tweaks or changes, I can actually get all these uh, benefits to health and performance of the people I in the space. I think that is one of the most important messages we're sharing today, that don't give up, don't think you can't be helped. Um, and I heard someone ask you, I guess it was a viewer typed in the question, what about mold? Because um, back to my house, we've been there 21 years. It's very comfortable. We leave the windows open all the time. I live in LA. At night, we never have, you know, there's no heat or air conditioner at night. And we've always been quite happy there until a little leak on the floor by the washer. We didn't know what it was. The pipe broke in the wall going to the garage and there's all kinds of mold in there because we didn't know it was seeping. And now I'm a little afraid. Like I live there, but you said something very encouraging about mold. Well, I think it's something, um, first, it's really uh, addressable and, and, and mold and moisture is up there. You know, if you control moisture in the space, look, mold, mold needs a couple things, right? Spores are everywhere. They're all around us. So it's got to find a water source. It's got to find a nutrient source. And so in an indoor space, if it's dry or relatively dry, a typical building conditions, it's fine. When you start to have a leak or something behind the wall, something you don't notice, yeah, you're going to have mold growth. Um, but it's something that you can uh, prevent pretty very easily. And if you see it, you can also remediate it. I think some of the challenges are when, uh, particularly um, uh, in, uh, in places that uh, are unable to or don't have programs in place to manage this, you can have long-term mold growth, you can have mold growth behind the walls, things you don't see, yep. but it's influencing the air in the space and the dust in the space. Uh, and uh, and you know people are reacting to it, and it's and it can be hidden sometimes. It's not always, you know, an obvious uh, mold growth on wallboard or up on the ceiling or a leak. Yeah, that yeah. you see. Well, today you're going to speak about the forces shaping the healthy building movement. Now, can you just give us a few little tips or secrets? <laughs> sure. I, I think um, there's been a perception maybe that um, after. COVID is the, the official emergency starts to be uh, uh, ending, at least in the United States, World Health Organization moving in this direction, that maybe our tension on healthy buildings is going to recede. I don't think that's the case at all. I think there are forces in play that are going to make sure this stays at the forefront of people's minds. First, the scientific and medical literature is being rewritten about this idea of airborne spread. So that is 
going to form the bedrock of future uh, design operations and principles. Um, the White House in the United States just had its first ever summit on indoor air quality that I spoke at. That is wow. the biggest bully pulpit in the United States talking about indoor air quality, something I never thought would happen. We see from that new standards coming out that will eventually come into code and change practice. And I think probably one of the most important one of, the, of uh, everything I'm going to talk about is that um, it's not just top down. People are really aware of indoor air quality at this point. Very few people maybe had thought about the field of public health. Very few people had heard about an epidemiologist prior yes. to COVID. Yes. Now people are talking about this. They're really aware um, because of COVID, and they're asking about this broader array of factors that influence their health. Yes, air quality. But now they're, oh, this wider lens is opening up. Well, what else in this space is influencing my health? And there's a key change that's coming. The proliferation of low-cost air quality sensors, which means there's a power shift happening. It used to be you'd have to hire someone like me, bring in an expensive piece of scientific instrumentation, tell you what the air quality is in this space. Now, relatively cheaply, someone can have their own device come in and tell you, the building owner, the hotel owner, um, the, home. how, the homeowner, how the air is in your space. It's a total power shift, and it's changing the dynamic because people are aware and they have the tools to tell you that something's not okay. And by the way, they're showing this on social media. Companies are being shamed all the time. Yay. They say, hey, Airline X, Company X, I'm in your store, your shop, your museum, your coffee shop, your office, and the air quality is X. And they'll show it. Um, and, and companies are going to have to respond to that. Yeah. The uh, market is moving it. Well, you told the Green Council that one problem um, was that different categories in the green building space are siloed. They don't always talk to each other. But here we are, the second annual real estate symposium. The attendees have doubled since last year. So do you feel like an event like this will help open up those silos? I think it's really important because it's a place, at least for me, that you can connect the science with the practitioners. And it's a really knowledgeable group. Mm -hmm. um, they're looking for the, the latest and the best. They drive it into their own practice. And by doing that, it influences the rest of the market. So at least for me, right, I'm an academic at heart, a scientist at heart, but I feel like that my theory of change is you have to get the science out of the peer reviewed journals into the hands of these people who actually put it into practice. Amazing. So I really like this place as a, as a idea sharing, but also I see it um, influencing practice, you know, immediately. Well, three other questions. We know we want to get you back there. Um, you said something very powerful that, you know, it's really great. Wealthy people have healthy homes and design green, but if it's made into code, what's the difference then? Well, this has been my big push um, that, yeah, good companies are, are, are doing it, are doing these, uh, taking these healthy building strategies and putting them into practice. But if we don't make this code or the standard way of practice, what's going to happen is we're going to increase the disparities and inequities we already see in the market. And we saw this play out through COVID. We see it play out over time in healthcare. And the same thing will happen to our buildings. So I'm a firm believer that, you know, the market has the ability to kind of uh, uh, set the trend, be a force for positive change, and it can drive the uh, standard setting bodies to improve what they're putting out such that it influences code. And once it influences code, then everybody has to do it. And um, there, there's, a, there's a way to, uh, for that to be verified and enforced. Right now, it's you know, it's, you can say anything you want at this Crap point. Shoot, but yeah. then now we say, here's code. Are you hitting the new health-based ventilation target? I think it's a massive change. Uh, and it's the way to address the inequities in the indoor built environment. And also because, you know, low-income housing, schools where the kids' brains are working all day. This is These are crucial goals to try to get a transformation in that sector. Um, just a couple other questions. Uh, you know, you talk a lot in the media. You are all over the media. As a business leader, how much time do you allocate for that? Do you think it's important? Well, I think it's critical, particularly my role as a public health professor. I think uh, if you're in public health, you have to have a public voice. I believe in that. Um, your public voice could be uh, verbal, it could be writing, but I think it, it's, uh, it's part of the job to translate the science into action that can help people. And for some people that's operating through policy levers, some people it's working through business, some people it's interviews and TV, some people it's writing. Um, but I think, yeah, you have to have a public voice in public health. And, and I think that's our role is to translate all this science. If it's just sitting 
in peer-reviewed journals, we haven't done what our job. What good is it do? What we, is it we haven't do? done our job. And then for the young people that listen, when last time we were in Tel Aviv, I had three people, one from, I don't know, France, another one from South Africa, another one from uh, Austria. Tell me she listens to this podcast. So wh- what would you tell people who are considering a career in public health? Why is that a good idea? I got the message for them. It comes from my dean. Whatever your skill, whatever your passion, there's a place for you in public health. Public health is a big umbrella. We need people who are interested in history, policy, healthcare, medicine, indoor air quality, engineering, epidemiology. Wow. Uh, and it's a great uh, blend. The, the success of public health comes when we blend all of that talent together to solve the world's stickiest problems and the, and the, the, the problems that can have the biggest health benefit. Sure, when a crisis like COVID comes along, public health was mobilized and played a big role. Public health is also playing a big role in the climate crisis. Public health is going to play a big role in deciding the, the fate and future of our built environment. So it's a great place for people who are mission-driven, uh, who believe in evidence-based science to inform policy and practice. So everybody's welcome. See there. And we want to thank you, Dr. Allen, because I will say that You put it simply. I've been doing the research on this topic to prepare for the podcast, and there's so much high-level jargon, but that foundation, nine foundations of a healthy building, we can all think about it. We can all do something about it. So thanks for all your hard work. Thank you. All right, everybody, here we are on our second interview today at the Globe Wellness Summit second annual Wellness Real Estate Symposium. We're sitting high in the air on 46th and Lex, I think, at the J.P. Morgan Chase Building. There's a lot of wealth in New York. We've heard from a lot of people that do fantabulous projects and single family ownership and office buildings. This is one of my favorite conversations though, you guys. We're talking to Jim Dobby and Deborah Wyatt. Jim is the founder and CEO of Zeal for Living out of Boulder, Colorado. And Deborah is the health and wellness leader why are they so cool? Because they deal with rental properties. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great, thank you. Why do you have the nerve to think that you can make a wellness property healthy and well? Well, you know, I just think, um, it, well, let me, let me just go back to a story. I, um, you know, my father-in-law was a, uh, is, is, is a doctor and he retired oh. and I started to um, see the transformation in his life um from when he was working to retirement and you talk to him today now that he's been retired for a few years and he's happier and healthier than ever really yeah what's his secret and and he's moving you know he's he's busy he's moving he's he has more social connections and and when i saw the environment that he was living in I said, you know, I said to myself, I was like, I can do this. And my background for the past 20 years, I've been developing apartment communities and, you know, pretty standard apartment communities that have, uh, uh, that are designed to appeal to everybody, you know, kind of down the middle of the fairway. And I said, you know, I can, I can take these skills and move it toward um, and bring in a lot of these elements that, that really make people live and thrive and and I can and I can do it without a, a big increase in cost and so so you know that that kind of got you thinking got got me thinking and got zeal going and um, and so our, our goal is really to make health attainable to to people in rental housing that is so encouraging because really wellness has often been decried for being, you know, certainly not very democratic, because if you can afford it, you can enjoy it. So this is a very cool topic. And Jim, just so our listeners know, it's not like you're just sitting in the corner dreaming this up. You have 20 years experience in commercial real estate, ops and development. And you, uh, what'd you do before you launched Zeal? What um, what did you sell and do? <laughs> that I'm looking at your bio. <laughs> Sure, yeah, I was working for a national development company, working to develop a lot of apartments, some shopping centers, office buildings, but really the past decade has been a deep focus in apartments from four to 30 stories in countries all around the city, all around, I mean, sorry, cities all around the country. Oh, okay. And um, so, yeah, so I just took that skill set and I, you know, added that in with um, some some wellness and, um, and then started working with a strategic partner um, that's in the healthcare business. And um, and so, you know, Zeal was born. And, and now we have a property that's under construction now 
and uh, that's just outside of Dallas and, and very excited to bring that to life and to work with Deborah to, to get it going. Well, let's talk a minute. Deborah, you have a background. I loved on your LinkedIn, it said hashtag women of real estate. I love that. <laughs> um, but you worked at a place called Canyon Pines in Colorado. I noticed that it really tried to celebrate the relationship between land and architecture. Mm-hmm. How did that inform you specializing in wellness eventually? So specifically with Canyon Pines, there that's one of their kind of pillars is to be one with the land and respect it. It's a definitely not on the rental side. It's fully custom architecture, fully designed homes, um, and lots essentially are what people buy and then build from there. Mm-hmm. But my kind of passion and heart and wellness started long ago in working with master plans around the country when we started to realize that there were populations where we had the ability to make an impact, whether they were training for their first 5K or giving them access to, you know, talks with the doc on specific things um, and kind of creating this this opportunity to help people live better. Um, and throughout my time and experience in, in that, we started to kind of get little snippets from developments all around the country of trying to figure out how to how to bring wellness to life how to make it more of an anchor in what they do every day um and you know i think in, starting in 2020 it kind of really accelerated the need from the general public to fully understand all of their options as a consumer when it comes to their health we instantly think gyms you know what you eat getting a personal trainer and those types of things but as we know there's way more to health than just that than just a gym membership and shopping at whole foods right to get specific what are your four pillars of wellness at zeal yeah well so um it's funny we deborah and i talk about this all the time we try to make wellness hip because you know i i i I was just telling you a story about a you know a a retirement community but but you know our audience we think our young is younger you know it's it's your um early family because we're, we're talking about rental homes here so single family homes that have a little bit of backyard and garage and things mm-hmm. like that so so early uh, family formation years so you know kind of early 30s when people are moving out of the little shoe boxes that we built for them downtown you know 500 feet doesn't fit a family of three mm-hmm. so they have to move out to the suburbs and uh, so so that's that's one demographic and then the other demographic is kind of what I call early empty nesters so late 50s early 60s the kids are flying the coop and uh, and they're and the, the parents are ready to downsize a little bit uh, maybe chase some grandbabies. They want to lock and leave lifestyle. They want to um, maybe unlock some equity in their home, but they still, and, and so they'll sell their home and move into a rental. And um, and so we we talk about how do we make wellness hip and yeah. and and so uh, move is one of our pillars. I mean, and that's very important. And and we don't talk about, gee, you need to go run a marathon. We're we're just talking about. And, and it's funny because. I keep telling Deborah, it's like, I want 25, 25, 25 all over the place. I want like our speed limit to be 25. <laughs> and then we want to talk about 20 minutes a day, five days a week. You know, That's move. so cool. You know, and it's just, and, and, and Deborah's thinking like, okay, well, it can't have 25 on the speed limit. I mean, what if it's too fast and stuff like that? You <laughs> know, and it's just, so, so move is one of them. Connect is another one, uh, another one of our pillars. And so, um, you know that, and that's Deborah's job to to really weave connection into the fabric of the community and the activities and the movement of everything that people are doing. Well, the move would be. Does that mean that you're designing walkways and tracks and things like that in your communities, or how is that implicated? How do they? How are they supposed to move? Yeah. So move can be just that. It can be you know that when you get home, you can walk to the amenity center. It's you know pedestrian friendly all the way to you have access to a gym, and there's support from group fitness or you know personalizing your training with a personal trainer or just having a walking group that meets you know at 7:30 every night. So Everybody's great. got their dogs out together. You know, it's just a matter of getting people out of typically their sedentary lives um, and just getting them to move more. If it's 20 minutes a day, five days a week, as Jim said, or anything along those lines, it's really just about being intentional. And you know, sorry to interrupt, but, but move and connect go together too, because, you know, if you can have that social bond with people and that responsibility and it's like, Hey, it's the 6am walking club, 
you know, and you don't show up, people are saying like, hey, where's Jim? Why, why didn't he show up today? Should we text him? It's like, hey, loser, get your butt out of bed. And it's that, so that true. type of stuff. And, and so it, you know, so these, that's why the, the community is very holistic and it needs to be designed and then operated because it's going to be there for basically forever, you know, 75, 100 years. But it, but it needs to be designed so it can be operated to support wellness. And that's what we're up to. So then, Jim, what you'd say is the dwell part of your pillars. Your four pillars are connect, move, nourish, and dwell. Correct. Oh, the dwell is making healthy buildings. Is that it? Absolutely. Right. So, you know, what, what we're talking about in these rental homes, we're, we're not talking about, you know, knocked out appliances. Uh, we're not talking about uh, five fixture bathrooms. You know, we, we want these things to be attainable, you know, and, and so people can afford to rent these. And um, but but what you will find in our homes are homes that uh, look at indoor air quality and oh. and and. Um, you know, have higher filtration, so the the indoor air quality is a little bit better. The um, we have uh, it gets a little technical, but mechanical air, so we're bringing uh, outside air, fresh air into the home, and then it gets filtered before it gets pumped into the home. So, so we we get good fresh air that's filtered. Uh, all of the appliances are are electric as opposed to bringing gas in. Um, so some people are okay with that, some people are not, but we just um, from you know, we just think uh, electric is responsible now, and then, and then when you go up to the bedroom in the in the in the primary primary suite, like I said, you're not going to see this five fixture bathroom, but what you are going to see is uh, temperature controls because we know that a, a good sleep environment is important to getting good sleep, and and so with uh, increased temperature controls, you can set that temperature in, in your bedroom down into the mid to high 60s, which is scientifically shown to be a better sleep temperature. For rest, uh -huh. uh, blackout shades. So, you know, if you're, let's say if you're working a late shift and you're sleeping late into the morning, you know, you can still give yourself a good sleep environment so the sun isn't waking you up. And, um, and so it's just, you know, simple things like that, that, that we're designing into these homes from the start. And then when you go look at um, the, the way the communities design, the homes are designed, we have porches on the front that are sized. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, that, that are sized to put some furniture on it. So you can sit out front, enjoy the outside, and also connect, once again, connect with your neighbors as they're walking down the street. Well, you know, this makes me laugh. I live in LA, as the listeners of the podcast know. And you know, everyone that arrives in LA, usually everyone seeking fame, fortune, whatever, they live in an apartment first, right? And, you know, the Melrose Place, that TV show, right? It's all the people you might be of the generation that hung out together and that was the beginning of their social life. But the only thing they really did together was drink by the pool or barbecue and drink <laughs> by the pool. So what are some of the activities, Deborah, that you're responsible for designing into the place? Yeah, so a lot of the activities are going to be focused around, obviously, on the on the nourishing side, right? So we want to do cooking demonstrations, but we're also going to have community gardens. So we're going to have the opportunity for people to either dust off their green thumb that they may have retired while they were growing their families if they're an empty nester coming back, or, you know, learn to have a green thumb. Wow. Um, I mean, I'm speaking from experience, my last tomato plant grew one. <laughs> so, you know, maybe I would benefit from some of our programs, but a lot of it's going to kind of feed into our pillars. So when we think about, you know, our welcome socials really are going to be it kind of indoctrinating them into what it lives, what it actually means to live in our communities. So all the various programs that they have, how they can interact and connect with us through the app, what fitness classes are available, you know, various things along those lines that can really kind of help them figure out how they can thrive um, based on the variety that we'll have. And I mean, our goal at the end of the day is when somebody lives there that we'll, we're going to have various challenges and various opportunities for them to learn more of how to live better. So when they leave, they're going to take these healthier habits with them that hopefully they'll have for a lifetime. When they do buy a home, right? Yeah, right. exactly. But, but, you know, I just love the whole idea of it's almost like a hotel. Have you ever been stayed at a resort when they have the manager's cocktail hour or whatever? Why does everything I say revolve around cocktails? I don't <laughs> right. know. But um, it is a way to meet each other and know who's staying there. And I live in a community of townhomes, and we see each other a lot because they're closer together when you pull in, when you pull out. And 
new people go, why don't we have a, a block party? Why don't we all just have a little, you know, appetizers one Friday night? People want to do it, don't they? Right. They do. And I think, you know, the interesting thing is people want a sense of ownership to it. So, you know, if we think about connection, there's connection to neighbor to neighbor, right? How they can connect and interact on more of an organic level. So whether that's, you know, leading the walking group or if you're a cyclist, you know, pulling those other cyclists in the yeah. community together. And then how can they connect to the community? So whether or not they're volunteering for a specific group or they actually have their own gardening bed and then the community to the surrounding area area you know there's plenty of medical opportunities and various partnerships that we can kind of bring in to foster so not only do they have the benefit of living in one of these communities but what other things that can we pull in to kind of foster that so as what well. did you mean by medical did you say medical opportunities yeah so there's obviously medical you know commercial opportunity if we think various health institutes around the country right whether it be family practices and those types of things how can we pull those partnerships in so they can you know have more group conversations around you know aging parents you know if you're just now starting to form your family you're in your early 30s maybe your parents are getting into their 60s and 70s and you're worried that you might have to figure out their health care right. and have those difficult and conversations, yeah. right? Um, and vice versa, maybe maybe you're a, an, an empty nester and you've got aging parents that, you know, you're trying to get them to go into an assisted living facility, but they're not ready. And you should have had those conversations a long time ago. So how can we provide them resources to kind of, you know, live well, not only for them and their family that live there, but just kind of various things that we think when it comes to So health. you mean beyond so. pickleball courts, you're going to have real conversations. Right. Is that it? Right. Well, and I should think, do both. Yes. Yes. We're <laughs> going to have pickleball courts as well. Yeah. But, you know, but pickleball, you know, maybe you don't know how to play pickleball yet. So we'll have the abilities to give people instructions so they can kind of get in and figure out new skill sets when they live there too. So. So one of the things that we've talked about as we as we move through these holidays, like we've got Mother's Day coming up and, and Deborah and I, we talk about like, let's start with our dream and work backwards. And what does it look like for these residents? And so so if you think um, on Mother's Day, you know, you wake up and you've got a couple group bike rides to go on uh, that have been organized by the wellness director. You could go mountain biking, you could go road biking, you go for a little bit of a walk. And then, and, and these are low and no cost activities. And so then, so then you come back home, you go to the, um, you go to the community raised, raised bed garden, and there's a farmer there that's, that's doing a little, little education on, hey, this is how you use your raised beds. It's the beginning of the growing season. This is what you can do, and this is how you get it going. So, so now you've had a little bit of education. You've hung out with your neighbors. You've, you've had a little bit of fun, but now it's time to eat. And so you're in the community garden. You clip, you clip a couple little uh, fresh mint. You go make yourself you know, a nice fresh mojito as you go over to the, uh, to, we've got um, just a, a dining room, you know, just an outdoor dining room, covered outdoor dining room where you can have- It's like an outdoor room. Yeah. I mean, they're very popular now. An outdoor right? room. And, and so now you, you have a meal with your, with your neighbors and um, you, the kids can play at the pool. We've got an art, little uh, artificial turf lawn. You can play a little cornhole and then you finish up the evening over at the, you know, the outdoor fire pit. And, you know, and it's all low and no cost activities that's, you know, you can participate or not, but it's been, you know, facilitated by the, the wellness director on site. And, and so that's really the, the goal to get everybody to, you know, you know, nourish is one of our pillars. And so to get everybody to connect well, I think it's so funny. I see you have experience like with HOAs. With those are notoriously uh, antagonistic mm -hmm. homeowners associations. Yeah. But to have a place, I mean, I just try to think about our community. If we had a wellness director, we'd all faint. You know, what I mean? right. sometimes we we do organize. You know, like at eight or nine at night, we do our dog walking together mm -hmm. because it's a lovely way to catch up and socialize. But you heard um, Deepak Chopra. Then we have. The Harvard um, head of healthy bu buildings program, you know, saying that buildings breathe. So what else have you designed into your plans that will just be like a gift to your inhabitants? Like low VOC paint or? So things like low VOC paint and, and carpet that is, is uh, you know, kind of off gassed already. You know, those types of things are fairly easy to do these days. Wow. And so um, we're planning on doing those. Um, but, but you know, the, the main 
main things in the um, in the units themselves and the homes themselves is you know this indoor air quality and um, you know one item was the is is um, the dimmable lighting it's called warm dim and so you can change the coloration for to help with circadian rhythms and um, and and once again it's that that being new construction it's it's really easy to do from the get go uh, from the get go yeah um, what. What would you say uh, you are located your first place is in Dallas or where is your first? Yeah, north of Dallas. North yep. of Dallas. Uh-huh. And any more in the pipeline coming? Yeah, we've got uh, n another one in South Dallas. Uh, then we're looking at uh, a site down in Austin area and mm. then also just south of uh, Denver. So we're trying to figure out who our, our you know, psychographic, you know, renter is going to be. And one thing that keeps popping up to the top is well-educated women. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I mean, that, that really is a very consistent pattern across a, a lot of these communities. Well, and I think to that point is if you think about a, a family, typically the, the female in the household, no offense, Jim, is, is technically acts as your, your chief medical officer of that family. They're the ones making the appointments, right. making sure people are staying up on up to snuff. And if somebody's got the sniffles, how we're trying to combat it throughout the whole entire house. And so, you know, that very well could be the case that, you know, mom or the wife is like, OK, well, maybe this will help me move a little bit more and inspire my husband to move a little bit more. And maybe we can eat more vegetables or, you know, I'd love to have my kids start to learn this early versus us having to wait, you know, three or four more years until we can have our own bigger backyard for them to run and play. But you know, what really kills me is um, the green grocers, you know, the, what is it? Air One, Whole Foods. You think of the kinds that are out there now. And when you go to Air One, you could pay $6 for a cookie. I mean, seriously, you could in the bakery and the, the coffee is definitely seven dollars a cup, right? But there's young people there that don't own homes, but they must prioritize organic living, right? right. Because they're there. So once again, for our listeners, what you're talking about is a, it's so hard to imagine. It's like if I would go and look at the place, I'd think, what's the catch? It's too good to be true. Do they really care about us? I mean, I think one of your pillars should be care because <laughs> because usually people that rent have to take what they get, you right. know. Um, so you're talking about a multi-purpose lawn where you can play games, picnic, relax, front porches, what? And that, that never happens. It is very reminiscent of the place Serenby mm -hmm. in Atlanta. He's here today that you would meet him. But it's a community with all kinds of, you know, housing. Uh, a little city, you might say, a little village. Mm -hmm. And front porches and communal gardens are, you know. But that's for people who, you know, want to buy a home, right? And then um, outdoor kitchen, community table. And I will also tell you, when you live in an apartment and you're new somewhere and you don't know anybody, if you hear a party going on in another apartment and you can see it, you think often, wow, I wonder why they didn't invite me. Right. <laughs> so in this way, you would have just the table right there. Yeah. Anyone could come. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And they'll be able to, to know what's going on through the community app and RSVP or, you know, drive by on your way after work and be like, oh, I totally forgot, but I know that it's there and there's still spots open so they can just join and and be right. a part of it. What's your favorite thing about working on this project, Deborah? I think my favorite part would be uh, really to kind of see it go from from concept, right, from paper to all the way through to actual like leasing up and people there mm -hmm. and, and what it's going to look like and knowing that as people start to gain interest and we see it kind of come to life, things are going to change. We're going to have new technology or new initiatives or new whatever, who knows, right, when it comes to to wellness that we'll be able to kind of pivot and evolve to make sure that our, you know, the residents are getting what they, what they need. And well, you, you said you'd, ha you'd have an app for the place you live. I love that. But Jim, do you think that, you know, we heard Deepak Chopra say the different chapters of your life. I've heard people say it's mm -hmm. in thirds some people say fourths, but definitely the last sections of life are for giving back once you've learned what you do and how well you can do it. Is that what was part of your motivation for making this? Oh, a little bit. Um, I think she's it, trying to say you're old. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, no. Not at all. This is my last chapter. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I hope not. Uh, 
you know, it, you know it's it's funny. I, I like I said, I've been in development for quite a while. I've I really, I, you know, I enjoyed working in the retail environment. Um, but you know, retail there's not a lot of development going on there. But but in retail, we talked a lot about placemaking, because in retail it's really finicky. And if if a shopping center isn't designed right, you can have dead spots where mm -hmm. you know people just don't go and the stores just don't survive. And so I got a great sense of placemaking working in retail. Will you tell, define for us, because not everybody knows what that word means in retail, in oh, real estate, placemaking. Placemaking, it's just, you know, creating an environment that really draws people in and they just, they, they have, a, it has a good emotive. It, it, it resonates with people. They might not know why. Um, they just go. But, but, yeah. they, but they, they move in there. The space feels good. It's, it's well lit. It's well designed. And it's at a human scale. It's, you know, as opposed to um, some of the massive department stores out there where, you know, you feel like a little ant walking through the front door. Um, and so really just t taking a lot of those skills and working with a lot of the architects and the landscape designers that I've known for over 20 years to, to take, take this, this skill set and, and um, design this community from concept to completion to, to um, to really resonate not with the masses, but with with you know what Deborah and I call a, the tribe. You know, there's there's going to be a, a tribe of folks that are going to want to live here, and with and, and and some folks, you know, we, we talk about some folks are going to drive down the road. They're going to you know they're going to be out in the suburbs. They're going to be looking for a rental home, and they're going to turn left, and they're going to go into a nice home. It's got you know four bedrooms and really nice fixtures, and it's knocked out. And they walk outside the front door, and they look around. And they say, okay, well I'm renting a home. So then they're going to walk across the street to one of our communities and they're going to immediately feel like they're in a little village and it has a little bit more of a pedestrian feel. And like I said, placemaking, you know, the streets are a little bit narrower. There's sidewalks that you can actually walk on and you feel comfortable walking on. There's these front porches that are adjacent to the sidewalks and you can see people and, and you know, it's immediately going to feel different. And then as they walk around and they see the signage talking about, you know, 20, you know, 25. <laughs> oh, you're going to get your way on that? Sign, my, my big idea is that the stop signs, it'll say stop, you know, it'll be like your standard red stop sign, right? And underneath it'll say take a breath. Oh, that's so good. But, you know, I still can't get over the fact that normally, literally, a rental unit is slapped together. And it's like, well, they're just running here. There's not, uh, you don't see a lot of care put into them. So, you know, a lot of times also people think in development, the real money is, you know, buy it, sell it, get it out, get out of there. Why aren't you like that? Why did you care about the the rental community? Well, I, you know, to be honest, I've done a lot of that. And, <laughs> and, and you know, I'm, I'm really enjoying creating a place. Um, a, a special place where, you know, hopefully people come and they want to stay. Uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges in the rental world is the, the turnover. And it's a challenge to the investors because, you know, more than half the people that move in move out in a year. Oh, is that true? In, I did in, not know that. In, in the suburban marketplace in the U.S., its turnover is about 55 wow. percent. So more than half move out. So for the investors, that's you know, now you have to repaint the place, you have to clean the carpets, you have to release it, you've got the downtime, so it's really expensive to change. And then for the residents, well, I mean, I think we've all moved, you know, in the summertime and it just, you know, it's hot and it's not fun and it's expensive for the residents. So I feel like we're creating a win-win by, by generating and creating a place where people want to stay, where when a new apartment complex or new homes down the street are built, they feel like they're really, you know, not missing out by, you know, or they're, they're missing out by leaving and they're not missing out by moving. You know, it's like, you know, it's just so often people just want to move to the, to the newest, greatest, shiniest object. But, um, but hopefully here they've got this connection and they really feel uh, anchored. What has been the reaction in the marketplace? other investors, other developers, what has been their reaction? Uh, well, so far, I mean, it's been exciting. 
um, because there are other companies that do build to rent and communities and various things like that. But knowing that we have kind of these these four main pillars that we anchor our decisions off of and design and plan and, you know, we'll activate with intention gets them to think, oh, well, you're actually thinking more like a developer like we do because you're invested long term. You're not in it to just move it and keep going and see a, you know, five years from now. Um, and so, you know, from the market standpoint, I think there's a lot of curiosity if we're actually going to do it, um, which we are. And so it's really exciting to kind of be on that forefront. And those that are interested in having these conversations with us kind of feel it and can believe it from us that we're, we're committed just as much as they are. So the price point would be about on par, like, I don't know. It depends on where the development is. If it's Texas or California, what the price point would be, right? But you're trying to keep it pretty much in par with the top of the rental uh, bracket in the suburban areas you go to, right? Right. Um, you know, we look at the homes that are for rent in the area, and we try to we try to uh, match that and, and stay in that range. We aren't we aren't going Uber luxury or anything like that. Well, that is so hopeful. You know, at the Global Wellness Summit, we always talk about the democratization of democratization of wellness and making it attainable for all. So as I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, it was such a highlight to see you guys there. And please continue to keep us updated on how it's going. And we'll try to help you spread the word as much as we can. And I think there's a really good heart in both of you there for making this your goal. We're going to watch the progress, okay? Perfect. Great. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.